Okay. I'm not a historian. Had I not moved to university, I probably would have been an ignorant schoolmaster. Um, so I have to be very careful. I'm treading on dangerous ground because um, there's a lot of history implied in the title assigned to me for this for this uh, talk. And uh, the previous speaker um, actually did most of the work for me already because he gave us a very good account of the historical subjugation of people in what today we call the third world, a very ideological concept. And by the way, with regard to the whole issue of dehumanization, I don't need to tell you this, there's a film going on right now, which I saw last Saturday, and although we know these things, but the impact, the emotional impact of actually seeing this reenacted in, I'm not an expert on films, but a well -known, it was a well-done film in my view, did not let me sleep well. And I think we owe this as respect for the thousands and thousands of lives which have been lost, I would say millions, throughout the centuries because of a monocultural imposition coming out from Europe, of which we are, seem to be so proud to be part of, I enter the city gate today and I see reenactments of colonial masters outside greeting us for touristic purposes, which I find ridiculous because I find this is one country which glorifies colonizers a lot. Um, on the other hand, we are always told that we should not always put the blame on colonizers. Of course, there are many factors which come into play. Even we should not always play the victim in the colonial setup because colon colonization attacks, the targets what John Ngugi from Kenya calls the mental universe of people. So we are both partakers of, when I'm saying we, I'm talking about we Maltese. I, I can't, I, I'm a, you know, I live, I've been born and raised in Malta. I never left this place except to study. And uh, particularly, you know, like, we are not just victims. We're also partakers of. Because when we want to ally ourselves with people who represent an idealized, imagined community, the way we imagine the British to have been, the European to have been, we are also investing in this kind of ideology works this way. Um, of course, um, colonialism played its part, big time, and I agree with the gentleman who said, you know, the European Union, or Europe rather than the European Union, and certain powerhouses in Europe have much to answer for in terms of the catastrophes we've seen throughout the ages. The most recent ones being the latest manifestation of it the drowning, etc., crossing. There is a very important colonial mindset at play here. This idea that we can shift southern populations at will. We've seen this with slavery, the slave trade, the slave trade, the role that Britain and other countries played in this. We've seen it with the Palestinian Nagba in 1948 about which we wish we will have a speaker here, probably one of the leading Palestinian historians on the Nagba, Nur Masalha, this May, towards the end of May. Uh, he will be discussing his, the documentary, The Land Speaks Arabic. We saw this with the entombment, as Karl Marx put it, with regard to Latin America, uh, in, indigenous populations in what we, now, what we now call Latin America, capital volume three, for all his Eurocentrism, Marx was very passionate when he wrote about this human catastrophe. He uses the word in translation in English, of course, and tomb, and he wrote it in German, of course. And uh, we saw this with Operation Bootstrap in Puerto Rico, when people were, uh, the Hispanic population of Puerto Rico were forcibly moved out and they moved to California and other places. We have seen it throughout all, all forms of history. Now we see it with migrants uh, being pushed out of Africa but because of a variety of reasons, many of them colonial, many of them neo-colonial, which includes legacies of colonialism, droughts, dest destruction, um, what else, um, 
And of course, certain forms of fundamentalism, which affect women badly, female genital mutilation, etc. People wanting to escape. Maria Pisani, it's a pity she's not here because she's done some wonderful research on this. And, uh, but the legacies of, of colonialism are very strong. One of the major things that I, I, I would discuss, you know, all you have to do is um, Google any country in Africa, then sift through some of the sources, and when you hit on certain sources, some sources are much more convincing than others, you will find the colonial history, how the map of Africa was drawn in terms of independence. So not only were, the, but were those places plundered for mineral resources, and also channeling the entire economy of those countries in terms of cash crops for production, which had an effect, therefore, on the production of food for local population, who had to then import the food coming from the colonial centers at exorbitant prices, which creates huge uh, problems in terms of poverty, because people can't afford that. Not only that, but the way the map of Africa was redrawn Prior to, you know, prior to independence, uh, as a condition for independence, the way countries like Sierra Leone were placed between French and, and English, etc., the way Eritrea was connected with Ethiopia. And uh, it was only recently that Eritrea completely broke off after the fall of Mengistu, if I'm not mistaken. But it was only recently, when you look at the situation, the way people who had been colonized and parcelized, that's the word I would use, in a rigid form of ethnicity, a rigid form of tribalism. I read somewhere, I'm not an expert on Africa, okay, and that sometimes we make a lot of sweeping statements about Africa. Non-Africans make lots of sweeping statements, which led a good friend of mine from Sierra Leone, Handel Kashopa, right to right, is this, an Af is, is this an African I see before me, how the West reconstructs Africa, a bit of Edward Said here, and Orientalism. Well, so I, I say this with trepidation, but I've looked at sources, and there are sources who claim that the tribal aspect of Africa has been uh, exacerbated through a rigid form of parcelization, which reinforced, therefore, a sense of, listen, us and them. And, uh, and this is not very different, but, but with much more tragic consequences, I would say, than multicultural policies today in the Western world. Because multiculturalism is also a form of absorption. You know, that's why I don't use that term. I use the word anti-racism rather than multiculturalism. As an educator, I don't talk about multicultural education. I talk about anti-racist education, period. And so at the basis of all this is a racist colonial apartheid system. Now, what I want to say because of time is limited, is just look at the case of Rwanda. Now, um, I'm 58 years of age, so I think I've read a lot, and uh, probably not experienced directly, but we've read a lot some, about some shocking events during my lifetime. I would say, uh, thanks to, uh, I'm reminded by my, the presence of a Chilean friend here, one of the most shocking things was the coup d'etat in Chile in 1973. And uh, I know Ramona is very much, uh, writes a lot about this, etc. I've written a bit because it, it, it affected me a lot. But one of the greatest catastrophes probably we've heard about, there, I'm sure there were others, let's not, let's not forget East Timor, which was silenced it's, uh, outside that part of the world for a long time. It was kept silent, you know, uh, for a long time. Uh, one of the most was Rwanda. That captured the imagination. I'm sure there were others, Burundi next to it, and it was very much connected with it. But just look at the role of European superpowers. How ironic that the organization in Europe, the European Union, okay, um, is, which is now um, keeping away immigrants, making it difficult for migrants from the south on the basis of quote-unquote security, okay, and therefore is intransigent, you to use the word burden sharing, I prefer to, they're not burdens, uh, immigrants are not burdens, responsibility sharing is for me is the, is the better term as far as I'm concerned according to my values. How, how ironic that Europe has its center, its seat, the European Union, sorry, not Europe, the European Union, for which by the way I do not vote that we should become members, uh, um, has its seat in Brussels. Brussels, a center of one of the most brutal colonial powers, 
this is documented by major historians. There is also a difference in terms of the brutality, although most colonial powers have uh, created their genocides, the British in Tasmania. I mean, uh, where you can, you used to shoot, they used to shoot uh, um, the indigenous people, the aborigines there with, with, with impunity. Um, Italians using poisonous gas in, a, in Ethiopia, etc. mentioned a lot by Don Milan in his defense of the right for conscientious objection uh, to military conscription, etc. When we, when, 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 we, when, we, when we look at that, Belgium was one of the most brutal. And it's amazing how even, how even certain racist pseudo-scientific theories which came out of Europe, including universities in Europe that Franz Fanon speaks about, okay, about the Algerian and the African, how it's constructed, etc. Franz Fanon himself being an African from Martinique. Um, those theories which found their manifestation also in Italy in terms of how the south of Italy gets depicted. I'm thinking here of the, of the, the obnoxious theories of uh, Cesare Lombroso, who is still being venerated in a museum in Turin, uh, how the, the, you know, he looks at, through phrenology, uh, at the Calabrian and how the propensity of the Calabrians to become a criminal. These kinds of theories were at the heart of racist colonial policies. And that is how they constructed, therefore, different particular groups or groupings or ethnic groups in a place like Rwanda, for instance, because the Tutsis, the, the Tutsis were perceived under, German, under the German period as being closer to us, you know, closer to us. And I say us because Malta has invested in being European, all right, closer to the European, so to speak, quote, unquote. So they are more human. So there's a theory of evolution there, okay, which is bloody racist. Then, well, that's, that's putting it mildly. Then, this, it also happens that compared to another group, which is now we call the Hutus, these were, they had cattle. They had cattle, they had property, that is. The others were hunters and gatherers. It's amazing how this gets constructed, and therefore the, the Tutsis are, are favored historically because they are closer to the European model. They become, therefore, the tax collectors. Now, we know from the Gospels how hated tax collectors in, in, in Judea were because they collected taxes for the Roman, but that gave them power. They were sort of elite. You know, you can identify elite in many societies. I learned this from Mario Vella once from a question he asked. Uh, you can learn... A, Who's collecting the taxes? Because when you, when you look at that, then you have some inkling as to who forms part of the elite, not the only one. So you had this. The Belgians come along and they build on this. They build on this. What do they do? They play off one against the other. But they impose a rigid ethnic group, ethnic definition, to the point that it reached a stage now, I'm not sure if it was under the Belgians or afterwards, under the protege, the Hutu president, who was bombed, who was, whose plane was shot down. And that was, you know, uh, Javier Miana, but I don't know how to pronounce the word. Um, that was also, you had to even produce everything in an identity card. You, have to, you had to identify your ethnicity. Now, that was also used for killings afterwards. So, playing off one against the other in a very rigid way, it is said, it is said, Sorry, my past time. It is said that, that um, before there was more flexibility. Once you get cattle and you own property, you could easily become a, you, you could easily become a, a Tutsi. Belgium then changed tack. All of a sudden, a series of conditions ca came along. Cert a certain group was threatening independence and fighting uh, Belgian influence because colonialism doesn't go away with independence. You know, there are other ways you know, we're still connected to Britain in many ways. We were still connected to Britain despite independence. You know, scholarships, the way you're trained, the way the civil service follows well, or support is meant to follow the British model, which it isn't. It doesn't. The colonial model it follows, et cetera, et cetera. There are structural issues. I'm, I'm, I'm going to conclude. All these led then to the genocide because when you have these ethnic things, you are favoring one, playing off one against the other, then obviously, and then uh, Europe kept away from intervening, and then we all know what happened in 1994. Now I have to really make, jump, I have to make this, this, this.